hello everyone and welcome to this SimScale webinar on AI and physics working together to accelerate engineering innovation. My name is Dr. Nagman Khan from the SimScale marketing team and I'd like to quickly say hello and, and ask Stephen, my colleague, Dr. Steve Laney, to introduce himself. Yeah, hi everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today and to introduce where we've got to now with our AI capabilities in SimScale. Fantastic. Let's see what's on the agenda, Steve. Perfect. So, Steve, I think it's a good idea to have a quick recap from the AI preview we did about six months ago, back in October. You know, back then we showed a preview of some very cool AI features that SimScale was working on and what we would be working on over the next few months, right? And today is that day. So we want to quickly recap that, but before we do that, it's important to take a step back for our engineers who use SimScale globally, uh, because trust is very important, right, in AI. So I guess one of the key questions that we've had coming in from our audience uh, before this webinar started is lots of companies out there are talking about AI, right? There's lots of established engineering simulation companies, there's lots of startups, right? So what's the what are the differentiators that SimScale is bringing? And also, where does where does AI fit in in SimScale's, I guess, more strategic vision and the future they see for engineers globally and making simulation available to everyone? Yeah, it's a really good question, Nagman. So at SimScale, we see AI as a really important technology that we need to embrace moving forward. Uh, with engineering. And personally, it's something that really excites me because what happened with ChatGPT and Dali and the other AI providers, we're doing something similar with SimScale because we're taking technology that hasn't been openly and widely available to everybody. And we're now putting it easily and readily available in everyone's hands to use. SimScale is one of the most easy to access platforms for simulation that you can get. Everything is cloud-based. All you need to do is go to simscale.com and you can access it. And through that, we can now provide AI to the masses as well. Amazing. We see Steve, really... you mentioned that... Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah, you mentioned uh, SimScale is super accessible, right, to the to every engineer. How accessible, for example, is the AI portion of that? I mean, do you need expert knowledge in, you know, decision sciences, you know, stats, uh, you know, because it's seen sometimes as very esoteric, but how accessible is the AI portion of that? Yeah, and this is something that I'll, I'll come on to later, but SimScale's AI solution is very differentiated in that respect because you don't need to have a PhD in data science to be able to prepare the data and to train an AI model on it. All you need to do in SimScale is run simulations as you would do normally, and then just point the AI training capabilities included in SimScale at those simulations. And we automatically select a subset of that data to use in the regression training analysis. And we automatically train the machine learning model so that you can then just use it. It's very straightforward. Amazing. Let's let's quickly take a look at this uh, agenda. So I'm going to hand over very quickly to Dr. Steve Laney, who's going to introduce SimScale and talk a bit about the AI-based physics um, in SimScale today and what's coming, a bit of a roadmap as well. And he'll also show you a live demo. We'll then have a Q&A session. So please do keep posting your questions using the questions panel in GoToWebinar. There's also a chat functionality in case you're having any audio visual issues. Uh, let me know, I'll be there responding to the chat. And right at the end, Steve's gonna show you how to get access to our um, early access program and how to get started working with SimScale. Thank you, Steve, I'll hand over to you. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Nagman. So first of all, let's just have a very quick overview of what SimScale provides for those of you that are new to SimScale. So SimScale is a cloud native simulation platform. That means that you don't need any VPN, remote desktop or installed hardware or software to access SimScale. It's always available in the cloud and you just need a web browser because it's completely cloud native. 
The other important differentiator of SimScale compared to traditional tools is the fact that broad physics and all capabilities are included in one simple, clean UI. You don't need to learn multiple systems. You can do multi-physics in a single platform. Because SimScale is hosted in the cloud, it brings other benefits along with it, like real-time collaboration and support. If you want to share a project with someone in a different geographical location, you just share the URL or invite them directly into the project, and they log in, access the data that you're accessing live. There's no need to share large files to be able to work together on simulations. Also, we provide live in-chat support. So if you've got any questions while you're setting up a simulation or running an analysis, you can ask one of our support engineers using the chat functionality, and they typically respond within a few minutes during business hours. So this is totally different to a ticket-based system where you might wait a week for a response. Also, SimScale operates at any scale. This is important because maybe today, all I want to do is run a simple FEA analysis, but maybe tomorrow I want to run a DOE study with 2000 CFD simulations. I don't need to switch on an HPC license or contact anyone at SimScale to be able to do that. Everything is just available at my fingertips as I need it. Also, you can invite anyone into SimScale so you can scale the number of users that are accessing it because all they need to have is a web browser. And due to this, it's very cost effective to use SimScale. There's no capex for obtaining hardware or software. Okay, and more specifically associated with AI and machine learning, having a system that runs entirely in the cloud and is cloud native has significant advantages for AI. Because you can run the training data that you require and the DOE studies extremely quickly and easily. You can leverage our GPU infrastructure that we already have to then train the models within minutes and then publish the machine learning models out to the users that need them. And they can use them alongside the traditional solvers directly in their web browser. Touching a bit more on this, I'd just like to spend a couple of minutes to talk about the advantages that this brings compared to a traditional approach where you roll out an AI strategy. So traditionally, you may have siloed data that comes from multiple sources. And you'd need to collate this data into a database so that you can then use it for machine learning. You need to pull it in from different silos, run some pre-processing, and you probably need data engineers to be able to actually collate this data in an organized way so that it can be used. The next step then is to actually train your models. And in order to do this effectively, you need a GPU infrastructure in-house or an HPC that has IT overhead and expense to be able to train your models. Then when it comes to distributing those models, you have locally installed machine learning models that may be installed on one or multiple machines in your organization. And there's no version control to ensure that everybody is running the latest model. If I log onto my machine today and I run a machine learning model, how do I know that it's the latest and greatest model that the data scientists have released? Also with this approach, your PDE, your partial differential solvers, are segregated from the AI solve capabilities. If I run an AI solve and I want to be able to compare it directly with a PDE solve, I don't have the two tools working harmoniously side by side. I need to go back into a different system and run the CFD or the FEA analysis and compare it with the AI solve. So how SimScale differs is the fact that we provide an end-to-end -end integrated seamless platform for your machine learning model approach. The data generation is very straightforward. 
everything is generated in SimScale. You can run large scale DOE studies seamlessly and in parallel. There's no need to collate the data. We do all of that for you in the databases that come with SimScale, all the storage is included. You don't need to prepare your data. You don't need to convert any data. You just point the machine learning model at the simulations that you've run, and then it's generated using our GPU infrastructure in the cloud. We take care of choosing which simulations to hold back and use for regression analysis during the training. It all happens automatically and you don't need to be concerned about it. And then when it comes to model management, you know that you're publishing the latest and greatest model and everybody has access to it. You control who can use it and you control what version is released. There's no need to worry that somebody is using an old version in a geographical location where they have to download it from a server, for example. Everyone has it live. And another great thing about SimScale is the fact that everyone has access to everything in the platform. So if I run an AI solve on SimScale and I'm not sure about the results, I can just choose to run the full simulation and then I get both results. I can look at them and if I've got a low confidence rating on my AI solve data, I can just run 20 more simulations, plug them back in to the machine learning model and iterate my model and improve it for the next time. So everything works side by side and is integrated. Okay. So enough about the, the theory of why SimScale works well in the cloud. Let's have a look at some actual use cases that we've put together. So in this specific example, we've run a centrifugal pump and we set up a parameterized model in order to create a training data set. And we just went through and changed some variations here to do with blade thickness, blade radius, diffuser length, et cetera. And we ran a DOE study. Uh, this ran 180 variants in parallel. So within two hours, we had created the training data set that we wanted to be able to set up this machine learning model. We then pointed the AI training uh, system at it and created a machine learning model that produces predictions of the velocity and pressure field within seconds. The accuracy of this model uh, is rated at 99.5% uh, accuracy for the pressure results. So it's very accurate for the data that we've put in and it produces a graph neural network so that we can actually parameterize this, we can change out different CADs and we get instantaneous results. So I'll show you this use case in the demo. On a slightly different model, we ran a, a muffler as an example, very similar setup. We set up a DOE study, we ran 200 models, trained a machine learning model within two hours. And again, very accurate results, 99% accuracy on the pressure fields that we see within the muffler design. And then for an FEA structural use case, there's an example here, which was even easier to parameterize. This was just parameterized in the SimScale UI to run through a series of different forces, a series of different materials. And there was 186 variants that actually run in only 15 minutes in SimScale in parallel, because this was a slightly simpler structural use case. And then again, creating the graph neural network from this took less than eight hours. And then we can get instantaneous predictions of the stress fields and the displacements with 99% accuracy on the stress that we're seeing from the prediction from the AI model versus the simulation result. So a range of different use cases as an example. 
obviously, I guess from this, you may be asking how accurate are the results really going to be? Well, these capabilities are enabled in SimScale uh, thanks to our partner, Navasto. And I'm gonna present a use case of theirs here where it compares how a parameterized car model with a machine learning model for it has been run with different roof heights. And we can derive a prediction confidence that says how accurate the results are going to be. And you can see the confidence score plotted on the y-axis against the result height on the x-axis. In the center of this plot, we have interpolation, which means that the data that was used to train this machine learning model was within the bounds of the roof height. So the machine learning model's results are going to have a high confidence score within this area. Outside of those lines, the roof height, the geometry, was different to anything that was seen during the training data. So the roof was higher or lower than any of the training data set. So that means that there's going to be a lower confidence score associated with that data because there's an extrapolation taking place. So at the top, we have a higher confidence rating and at the bottom, a lower confidence rating. If we look at some results, some simulation uh, prediction results, we can see how this uncertainty actually comes out. So on the left-hand side here, you can see areas in red from this CFD simulation where there's a high uncertainty and where it's blue, there's a low uncertainty. If you compare that with the image on the right, you can see a very good correlation between the areas where we have a high uncertainty in the result and the error. We're plotting the error on the right-hand side. So the error of the AI prediction versus the simulation result. Where the error is high, the color is red. And there's a very strong correlation between the uncertainty and the error. So this is really good functionality because it can give us a lot of confidence or obviously a lack of confidence in our prediction. And it means that we can output a confidence rating so that as the end user of the machine learning model, you can see that confidence rating immediately in your AI prediction. And you know how much you can trust that data because you're immediately told whether that data is within the training data or not. If you have a low confidence rating, you know that you might need to augment your training data with some more cases. We can see here a plot of the predicted CD value against the true CD value. And you can see the dots are colored according to the uncertainty. And the points that are further from the line are have the most error and they also have the highest uncertainty. So it's a very good way of measuring the confidence and knowing immediately how accurate your prediction is going to be. Okay, so I'll come on to show that in the demonstration in a couple of minutes. Before we do that, the final thing I want to talk about is where we see SimScale fitting into uh, where we see AI fitting into SimScale's architecture. So there's many different stages for simulation, from bringing in the original CAD, preparing it, the simulation setup, the mesh setup, running the mesh, viewing the 3D results and obtaining the final scalar results at the end. And we really see AI as a strategic part of SimScale because we envisage that AI is going to slot into all of these processes in the simulation setup. Our vision at SimScale is for simulation to become something that happens a bit more in the background than in the foreground. Things are going to happen automatically. 
a design engineer isn't necessarily going to have to worry about setting up a simulation, but their designs will be informed by results that are happening in the background. So we have different capabilities associated to this, and we already have things in production and some things which are coming soon. So in production, we already have the capability to predict how long a simulation run is going to take and select the correct machine in the cloud. And we have AI simulation capabilities. So we have in production the AI preview capabilities, which I'll show in the demo in a moment, where we can predict 3D results and scalar results and provide performance indicators for simulations. Also coming soon, we have the AI simulation capability. So with the AI simulation, you'll be able to actually save the AI simulation alongside other simulations in the project. You'll be able to post-process it and download the results. Also, we're looking at being able to make predictions. So if there's problematic areas in the CAD, as soon as you bring those in, an AI algorithm may determine that there's certain features that should be removed, like holes that another user has taken out, or fillets that should be removed before you simulate. And setup suggestions. So if you bring in a vehicle for an external aero simulation, SimScale may recognize that and say, okay, this looks like you want to do an external aero. Here's a simulation setup example to make your life easier and more straightforward in getting to the end results. Also, um, we have AI insights on the roadmap as well to be able to predict problematic areas and alternative designs. So essentially, this splits what we're generating into two buckets, the AI simulation and the AI co-pilot. If you're a developer, I'm sure you're familiar with coding co-pilots that are already available to help you out while you're coding. Well, that's exactly what we envisage with simulation. Almost like you've got a simulation expert sitting next to you, guiding you through the setup and making sure that you don't make errors that are going to provide erroneous results. Okay, so enough about the overall vision. Um, I'd like to show you how this actually works in SimScale now. So all I need to do to access SimScale is go to a web browser and log in, and then I can see all of my simulation projects where I've got unlimited storage to save my data and run simulations. First of all, let's set up a, a new simulation. I'm going to set up a, a bellows simulation here just like the one that I showed uh, in the example. And the first thing to do is to import a CAD geometry. So I'm going to import a parasolid here. Obviously we support all proprietary and intermediary file formats. And here I can see I've got a bellows and I'm going to set up a simulation. In this instance, a static structural simulation. And just like with many simulation tools, I'm going through the tree structure here to actually set up the simulation and get this going. So I've assigned rubber as the material, and then I need to do a couple of boundary condition assignments. And what we're going to do is we're actually going to set up a, a force on the top. I've fixed the bottom, and we're going to assign uh, 20 newtons in the X direction. So everything's ready to go there for a simulation. I, I can start a simulation. Uh, and that's going to take a few minutes to complete on a cloud instance. I don't need to worry too much about that. That's the standard SimScale capabilities. But uh, if I want to get instantaneous results and I've set up a machine learning model in advance, I can get an instantaneous prediction of what the deformation and stress fields would be for this part. So let's have a look at the, the stress fields. I can see uh, some peak stresses in the bellows in the X direction on either side, as I would expect for that loading. And you'll also see, I can see the confidence rating here. I've got an 
confidence rating. So I can be quite confident in the simulation result. If we have a look at this side by side, um, I can see that the prediction was correct. I can be quite confident in this result. On the left-hand side, uh, we can see the actual FEA simulation result plotted with the von Mises stress. And on the right-hand side, we see the simulation prediction. And there's a very good correlation between the two results. So the confidence rating is correct and gives me a good understanding of how accurate this data is. So let's have a look at a, a slightly different setup. For example, maybe we would want to run a CFD analysis, in this case of a uh, muffler. Now, when it comes to CFD, there's a lot more benefit running an AI solve because I can get instantaneous results here from the AI solve capabilities. And instead of taking a few minutes to run, this is a CFD result. So obviously this would take longer to run in reality. So I can see an instantaneous prediction of what the pressure results can be. I can make changes to the boundary condition, for example. I could try a higher flow rate. And again, I'll get an instantaneous result of what the pressure field would be. I can also swap the geometry to a completely different geometry. And again, I'll get an almost instantaneous result of what the pressure result would be. So the real benefit here is that I can run many different considerations and designs, and I can immediately see what the result would be. So I can iterate a lot quicker through designs at an early stage in the design process. The actual simulation result here would have taken about 10, 15 minutes to run. So there's a lot more benefit to be had from getting those instantaneous results. So let's also have a look at something that's a bit more complex uh, with a rotating region, a um, rotating machinery component. So here we're looking at a centrifugal pump uh, and this notches up the level of complexity again. So the simulation result would take 30 minutes in this instance to complete. And again, we can get instantaneous result predictions of what the velocity or pressure fields would be for this centrifugal pump as well. So here we can see what the pressure results would be plotted on the surface in an instantaneous manner. And this model uh, has nine blades. This was a completely different geometry to what was seen during the training data because it has a different number of blades. We could also change that even further. Um, and we could look at a geometry with an elongated draft tube. So just to show that we don't have a bounding box here, we can change the geometry and we still get an accurate prediction of what the simulation result would be, even with a geometry, which is very different from the training data. Nine blades, that wasn't seen in the training data, and this length of draft tube also wasn't seen. And again, we can compare those side by side uh, to see how the results compare as well. So on the left, we see the actual simulation result in SimScale, and on the right-hand side, the AI prediction. So there's a very good correlation between the simulation results. So again, we can trust in that confidence rating and know that these results that we're getting in seconds can really be used to inform our design and make decisions about which are the best candidates to take forward for a full PDE solve. Okay, so that concludes what I wanted to show uh, during the demonstration and the background. I'd love to hear any questions that you've got as we've been going through that uh, and to discuss those now during the Q&A.
Steve, thank you. It was an um, extremely compelling presentation on the capabilities that have come really a long way since the preview launch we did back in October last year, which was a pivotal moment for SimScale. And the, the amount of questions we're getting really reflects that. So let's jump into the Q&A session and we'll try and cover as many as possible. Steve, I'm going to cluster some of the topics together. OK, because some of the a, okay. a lot of the attendees are asking similar questions. So mm -hmm. we'll start off with questions around the the data. OK, so several attendees have asked um, kind of overlapping questions. How mm -hmm. how will we train the AI model? Uh, is this something SimScale does or is this more of a self-service? And related to that is the data that is used to train the AI model can that accept an external source of data? For example, is there an opportun opportunity to upload physical laboratory data as well as simulated data? Okay, great. Yeah, they're, they're really good questions. So right now with the AI prediction, um, we train models at SimScout. So if you would like to run a project with us, we can train models directly on your simulations and provide you with AI solve capabilities. Coming very soon is the ability for you to train your own models. So you'll be able to have a UI where you point at the specific simulations that you want a machine learning model based upon, and then you'll be able to manage the machine models yourself within your organization. At the moment, this is done by SimScale staff but the capability is coming to you very soon. So that's the answer to the first question. And then the second question about the data sources, at the moment we're restricted to training on SimScale data, but we are also looking at other alternatives to bring data in from third party sources. So we are working with uh, some partners in this respect to bring in simulation data and make machine learning models out of that that run in SimScale. But the simple answer for now is you need to create yeah. that data and run the DOEs on SimScale. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. And if you'd like to work with SimScale to do that, Steve, at the end, will show you how to join the early access program. Steve, just sticking exactly. with the theme, yeah, just sticking with the theme of data, uh, a couple more questions. I'm, I'm clustering these together. Is do we need to parameterize the models for training, or can SimScale use un or non-parameterized data sets? And talking of data sets, how much data do you need? How many samples? before the predictions become, uh, I guess, valid is the word, right? As opposed to the, the accuracy. Yeah, yeah, okay. That's really good question. So the data doesn't have to be parameterized that you use to train the models. Um, it can be one of the easier ways to run a DOE study um, is to actually parameterize a model and run off a hundred simulations or so, and then use that to train a machine learning model, but it doesn't have to be. If you've already got simulations built up that aren't parameterized, uh, just a disparate set of simulations of something, you can definitely build an ML model based off of that in SimScale. And then when we talk about how many simulations you need, it, it really depends on what you're looking at. If it's a relatively simple design space with not too much geometry change, not too large a space of boundary conditions, then we're looking at maybe 50 to 100 simulations to get a high prediction on the simulation result. If we're looking at a much wider space where the geometry changes in many different form factors and we've got different materials as well as different boundary conditions, then we could be talking more like 500 to 1,000 simulations to get a strong prediction. So it really depends on the use case, and we'd be very happy to work with you and help you build up a good machine learning model. Fantastic. So, so a lot of you are asking about uh, the AI features and whether it's part of 
the community plan or pro plan stay tuned steve at the end is going to show you in in, in about six seven minutes time how to get access to these features okay let's let's crack on with the q a so uh just sticking with the data theme uh steve we have people asking if you can model um multiple types of physics together in one component for example fea and ai or would you treat these completely separately yeah so you would you could obviously train multiple ml models on different physics but we would treat those separately our solution is physics agnostic so you can run any physics but you need to train a specific model on a certain type of physics so it knows what it's looking at uh, so that could be fea conjugate heat transfer um, cfd modal analysis etc but you need a specific model uh, for a specific use case fantastic some of you are asking about the slides and the recording yes that will be made available give us a couple of days after this uh, webinar ends and we will share a recording of this presentation with you so steve let's move on to the next set of questions they're around limitations to the current model so one of your attendees is asking if is it ready? I know you showed some answer, uh, some figures around accuracy. Mm -hmm. Is this okay to base design decisions on? So that's one part of the question. The second one is, how long does it take to train a model? I mean, how much how much effort is actually required? Okay, yeah. So um, can you base design decisions on it? Well, honestly, I would take the confidence rating that you get provided and decide that on yourself. Um, typically, the way I see this being used and the way a lot of our early adopters are using it is to run many iterations at an early stage, quickly get a result and determine which designs are the candidates to take forward. And then you probably still want to run a full resolution simulation on those design candidates to validate that they are correct and then go through to production but obviously it's completely up to you uh, what you do with this capability and uh, yeah sorry Nagman what was the second question uh, how long does it take to train models what kind of input is required input effort yeah of course so um very little effort to actually train the models so long as you've got simulations to base the model on you just literally select the simulations that you want to train a model on, and then the model is trained in the background on GPU instances. So you don't have to worry about it. You get a notification once the model is trained in a few hours, and then you can push it out to your users. Fantastic. Uh, the next question is, if you start training an AI model, start getting some results, and at a later date, you have more training data or you want more training data, can you extend that prediction with additional data? Or is it a continuous process? Does the model get better and better the more data you feed it? Of course, yes. And you know, take a pump example. You may have a couple of different pump designs that you can base a machine learning model from, and you start using it. Then a year down the line, your pump has changed significantly, you've got a different design and you're getting a lower confidence rating. So in that instance, you can just run some more simulations on the new pump designs and feed that into the machine learning model to improve it. And over time, your ML models will get better as you feed more data in and develop a bigger database of data to pull from. So, of course, they're ever evolving and improving, yeah. and you're always building up a larger data set to use for AI. Fantastic. Steve, we, we have an attendee. In fact, we have two questions which are very similar. I'll, I'll try and paraphrase. If you're spending a lot of resources, you know, GPU, CPU hours to train the model, right? Mm, Roughly, yeah. Is this is this how computationally expensive is this for a client, a customer organization uh, to do? And at what point does it kind of okay? You, you've you've used two thousand simulations to train a model, but maybe in two hundred sims you could have actually come to a design decision. What's the, what's the trade off there? 
Yeah, it's a really good question, really. And yeah, AI is not the answer to solve every problem. This sort of setup is best suited to when you have relatively similar simulations being repeated. So you could run a massive simulation setup where maybe you run a matrix test of a thousand simulations and then you just use that as a lookup table. But that would be more limited than an AI capability because as soon as you change the geometry, your lookup table won't work anymore. With the AI solve capabilities, you don't have to run the whole matrix as well. You could run some tests at the extremities and then some tests within that. So a smaller number of simulations and it's more applicable to different geometry changes that you would have as well. The actual training doesn't use that much core hour usage either. It just trains on a single GPU instance and it's not costly to run. And the simulations, you would, so long as you're repeating the sort of designs and reusing your data, you're going to benefit from the fact that you've run those simulations, trained a machine learning model on them, and then you're using that simulation data the next time. So the more you design and the more you simulate, the more cost effective it will become. If you're an organization that does completely bespoke designs and they're different every time, then this probably isn't the right tool for you. Okay, fantastic. Steve, data security is a big topic, right? Especially when you're sharing data, uh, you know, on the cloud. So um, if an organization is sharing data with us for their particular application and their models, would SimScale potentially use that data to train more generic models for wider public use or how, how exclusive would that data be? Yeah, so this is all down to uh, contractual agreements with our customers and we don't reuse customers' data or make use of it for our own models. In SimScale, your data is completely your own data and you retain all of the intellectual property rights over it. Everything is encrypted in the servers. Even as SimScale staff, we don't have access to your data unless you grant us access to it. So everything is secure. Excellent. We we actually had two more questions exactly like come like that come in as you were answering that. So I hope that's answered your questions as well. We have one specific question uh, about bounding box, Steve, and then we'll move on to the next section. So do you need to have a bounding box? No, you don't. There's no bounding box. That's one of the benefits of running a graph neural network. Fantastic. We have multiple questions now. I'm going to group them together and it's all about the next step, Steve. So this might be a good time for you to talk about the early access program. But just to summarize, we have several attendees asking uh, how in practice does the SimScale AI training work? For example, the customer organization does the simulation, delivers the simulation, or asks SimScale to do the simulations for them, delivering them the data. What's What would be a typical workflow of getting this started? And this leads us nicely to the early access program, Steve. Yeah, it's a really good question. So right now what we're doing with our early adopters of this solution is we're getting them set up with SimScale. Some of them are already using it. So they're generating the data that they need to run AI models in SimScale. And then we're training models on that data. So we don't need to actually receive the data. We can then just point the training at those models that the customers have generated and produce the machine learning models for them. There's no need for us to actually see the data, download it, transfer the data at all. So. Uh, that's how we're actually setting it up. And then those ML models are available to be used internally by those customers. Very soon, we won't need to be in the loop for that as well. So 
our customers will be able to train their own models uh, without input from us. So if this is of interest, uh, please do contact us. You can contact me or Richard directly. Uh, you can see our email addresses here or scan the QR code or just reach out at simscale.com. Um, and it would be our pleasure to talk to you about your use cases and uh, get you set up and start using AI with SimScale. Fantastic, Steve. This has been a very exciting webinar and thank you to the attendees for all the questions. Still some more questions coming in and what we'll do is in the follow-up email we sent to you with a copy of the recording, we will address some of these uh, FAQs as well and share the contact details for, for Steve and Ricard for you to get in touch with them. I'm just going to say thank you from my side, hand over to Steve for some closing remarks. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, I'm absolutely thrilled to see how many people joined and how many questions we had. So please do get in touch and I look forward to seeing you in the next meeting. Bye.